Hi, today we're back on the Uplighter project and we're going to be looking at the main LED light source that we're going to use for the project. Now over the years I've used a whole variety of different high power LED products. This is just a few of them that I happen to have to hand. Uh, but what we've got is quite an evolution of hardware here. So these are some of the early ones, the Luxian 1 watt LEDs, the ones that started off all of the high power stuff. Uh, these ones have the optics fitted. Then we've got a slightly later model, the 3 watt version. I think these are the Luxian K2s that had a significant increase in brightness and slight improvement in thermal performance. Then we've got the Luxian Rebel, which is still a current product today, uh, and that is significantly smaller in size. And the idea is that you can pack these very tightly if you want greater light output, um, and then it really allows for very high light density. Now, another approach is to use sort of these LED arrays where there's a whole bunch of dyes in one chip. Uh, and then we've got some other examples. I think this is an Osram Golden Dragon or something like that. And uh, this is one of the white LEDs, mid-power from Luxian. Uh, and a large PLCC type format just here. Uh, but one thing that I've kind of noticed is as things have progressed, you've just really gone to much, much smaller LED sizes, which means that you can really pack these in very tightly into a very small space. Now what I'm looking for in this project is a fairly decent cost to brightness ratio. I'm not entirely sure how bright these need to be, so this is going to be a little bit experimental. We might go through a couple of iterations with a few different LEDs. Uh, but what I want is an RGB channel plus a white and a warm white so we can change the colour temperature. And on the LumaLED's website, for example, they've got a whole bunch of different LEDs available. Uh, you know, we could use an RGB LED and then a separate white light sources. We could use individual RGB LEDs and individual white LEDs. They did have this fairly nice looking one, the Luxian 5052, which I've got a few of here. This is a 5mm LED. It's got the RGB channel plus one white. And what we could do is have a couple of these, some with warm white and some with white, and then duplicate up the RGB LEDs, and that should get us pretty decent brightness. The downside to these ones is that the forward current is fairly low so we're talking like with all of the LEDs on less than sort of 200 milliamps so we would need at least five or six of these probably the cost isn't too prohibitive if we buy t 10 of these it's about 10 pounds which isn't too bad uh, we could imagine that we could get a light source from these for about six or seven pounds depending on how many we need and as I said we could mix up some warm white with cool white to give us the option to change the color now there are some other options like this one from Luminous, this has 2 amps per channel, it's a fairly bright LED, that's coming in at about £10 each. But I was looking further down here at the higher brightness LEDs, we've got the Luxian C's, which certainly could do the job, the Luxian C's had a slightly different version. Uh, we've got this that's just royal blue only. The Luxian Rebels, which I've used many times in the past, and then these Luxian Rubik's LEDs, which are really, really small, I think 1.4 millimetres in each dimension. And the thing that caught my eye about these is they have a super high drive current, all the way up to 3 amps, depending on the colour. So I thought we would experiment with those today. Now, there's no specific reason for choosing these over some of the others, other than the fact that I was quite interested in the actual device itself. They come in, they're kind of a pound each once you've bought 10 or more of them. Uh, but they are quite interesting. They're designed to be packed in extremely tightly onto an aluminium or copper PCB. But I thought we'd just experiment with those today just to see what they are like. So here are some of the LEDs and as you can see they're unnecessarily small for this project. I've got no size constraint that requires me to use these. I was just more interested in the evolution of super small high power LEDs. Now if we look at the data sheet you can see at 1.5 amps we can get pretty decent brightness out of these LEDs. Um, and in fact, the green channel is rated for up to 3 amps, but at 1.5 amps, we're talking at about 310 lumens. Now, we compare that to that RGB LED package that we looked at before, and at 120 milliamps, we're getting 38 lumens. So if we had 10 of these, we'd draw 1.2 amps, and we would be getting slightly more light output. So the cost for such a small LED and driving them hard is that we do get slightly less efficiency. But they present an interesting challenge because the fact that you could pump three amps into a tiny one of these and pack them all together means that you need to have fairly decent thermal performance on the PCB that you're attaching them to. So today's video is sponsored by JLC PCB because I think they offer some of the lowest cost metal core PCBs out there. If we have a look at their website, 
you can get five 10 by 10 aluminium PCBs for just $4, which is an order of magnitude cheaper than any of the other overseas suppliers and probably 100 times cheaper than some of the UK suppliers. So really, really good value for money there. But you can also get copper core PCBs made for the times when you have extremely high power density LEDs or other components on there. And for a 10 by 10 board, you can get those for $47 for five. But I noticed certain quantities, like if you increase that to 10, you still get that same price. And if we increase this up to 100, for example, uh, then the price goes down quite significantly uh, per board. So really, really good value for money. And the nice thing about these copper core PCBs is if you have an LED with a heatsink pad, you can actually uh, not place the dielectric layer where the heatsink pad is. Now, you might just be able to tell here we've got conductors from the two pads either side, but this heatsink pad is actually the copper core itself. So when you reflow the LED, you're actually attaching the heatsink pad of the LED directly to the copper core, which means that you get the ultimate sort of thermal performance. Now, unfortunately, with these Rubik's LEDs, they don't have a specific heatsink pad. They've just got two pads because the size is so small. But we can still use one of these copper PCBs, which will give us really low thermal resistance to our heatsink. So what I've done here is had some PCBs manufactured at JLC PCB. And so this is a copper PCB, as you can see. So 1.6 millimeters thick. Uh, it's really quite a heavyweight PCB. And you can see we've got the little footprints for the Rubik's LEDs on this board, including a little schematic here, just so I can remember how it's all connected. We've got a footprint here for a 0.1 inch pin header that allows us to plug in from underneath. So the idea is ultimately that we will have this 70 by 70 millimeter board with the 70 by 70 millimeter PCB driver underneath and then some pins going up that allows to plug into this board. And then we've got the um, thermistor just here monitoring the temperature of the PCB. So the schematic is very straightforward. One thing that you'll notice in the data sheets when you look at LEDs is generally they're more efficient at lower forward currents. Um, but what we've got here is pairs of white LEDs and pairs of red, and then just the green and the blue. Now the green and blue have a maximum forward current of three amps. The red only 2.2 amps, and the white LED is only 1.6 amps. So I've doubled these up. It means they can operate at a slightly more efficient operating point on their curve. But also with the two in parallel, we could drive the entire string at its maximum three amps. Same for the red. Uh, having two in parallel, technically we could drive these up to 4.4 amps. Now I think the drive current is going to be somewhere around two amps or so. But as I said, we need to see how much light we actually need from it. Uh, and this gives us a few options. And as you can see, they're wired all in series with little taps off so that we can shunt out the various LEDs. Here is the PCB layout, and what I've done is I've placed the LEDs in such a way that we can connect everything with polygons. And also with copper core PCBs, generally you're restricted to only one routing layer. So it did take a little bit of fiddling around to get the optimal layout, but everything here, as you can see, is connected with polygons. So we've got nice thick tracers between each of the LEDs. Now with a copper core PCB, unlike an FR4 board, you don't need to rely too much on the tracers for heat sinking, but if we can increase the copper area, then that does obviously help. So this is what we ended up with. And in fact, the only two normal sort of tracers are the ones going to the thermistor just here. And as you saw, here is the result. Now I've made probably a slight mistake here. I should have added a little bit of solder mask to the edge here, because if any of the solder paste dribbles down the side here, then we're gonna short out onto the copper core. So we just need to be cautious with the amount of paste that we apply here. Uh, the other thing that I want to just quickly check is I think we're going to apply some paste just to one of these boards. We're going to have to sacrifice one and just check it reflows properly in the oven because uh, I'm not sure if all of this thermal mass will mean that we need to extend the reflow profile. So I think we'll just try that first and then we're going to assemble up two of the boards. <laughs>
So those PCBs reflowed quite nicely. I did have to tweak the profile slightly to extend the soak and also the reflow time because it does take a little bit longer for these copper PCBs to come up to temperature. But as you can see, that's all reflowed quite nicely. And you can see the 0.1 inch header. Now this header is designed to accept pins from either side. So what we'll be able to do is have the control PCB underneath with some pins going up through the PCB um, to allow us to connect to the LEDs. Now there is a slight problem. Um, basically the stencil that I ordered was too thick and I didn't realize that JLC PCB actually offer a wide range of stencils. So if you look on their website, actually they offer the full range of stencils, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.12, 0 0.15, 0 0.18 and 0.2. Or if you pay extra, you can have um, either thicker or thinner stencils and I knew that the stencil was going to cause a problem. I think the standard is 0.15. I knew it was going to be a problem with these components because they haven't got any pads on the side of the LED. So basically it sits on the solder paste. So you don't need very much at all. And I thought we'd just get away with it. And I think it's fine for testing, but for future reference, if you do need a specific stencil thickness, you have to specify it in the text on the website. I was looking for an option and I didn't see any um, click buttons or anything like that so I ended up just ordering with the default thickness uh, but a bit of a mistake there but I think this is good for testing and we should be able to power these up and see how bright they actually are. Right so I've connected the string up to the power supply so this should illuminate all of the LEDs and there we go so that's on at one milliamp you can see the green is extremely bright there actually the green's very efficient let's turn up the brightness so we're at 50 milliamps there. Three hundred and fifty milliamps, that's looking very bright. Half an amp. And then up to about one point two amps, and that is blinding to look at. Let's have a quick look at the thermals. Now I've got a new thermal camera here, which I'll do a review of soon. Uh, but that's recording the temperature. And the green LED is the one that's getting very hot, actually. It's coming up to about 130 degrees C. So that is the die temperature. I think these are rated for an absolute maximum of 150 degrees C at the die. But for some reason, that green is getting way hotter than all of the others. Let's see if it does the same thing on the other board. Maybe there's a little bit too much paste and it's causing too much thermal resistance. And again, that green LED is climbing very rapidly. It's already up at 128 degrees C. So... That's a little bit too hot for my liking. I think if we were to use these particular LEDs in the design, I think it would be safest to double up at least on the colours if we want this kind of brightness. Here are the white LEDs, so the warm white and the cool white together at about 7.5 watts. And this is giving off loads of light. And the colours are really quite nice as well. I think these were both CRI 90 LEDs. So uh, yeah, loads of light, but this PCB is starting to get very hot now, so I'm just going to put it down. And the colours from these LEDs is also really nice, so really nice, deep, saturated colour. And here is the royal blue, which the camera is having a lot of trouble focusing on. The royal blue from these Luxian LEDs is probably one of my favourite colours. It's a really deep 430 nanometer blue, and it does cause certain items in the room to fluoresce. It's a very nice colour indeed. Now, the green is getting too hot for my liking. So I think when we set the current on the driver board, we're gonna to have to drive this a little bit lower than I'd hoped. It's fine for the prototype, but really I think we need to duplicate up the colored LEDs. Now the reason the green is getting hotter than all of the others is when you look at the data sheet, that green has the highest voltage drop. So 3.8 compared to 3.16 for the blue, for example. So when you're driving the same amount of current through these, the green, is dissipating more power which is why it's getting hotter. Uh, I'm still not sure how you're supposed to keep the junction temperature 85 degrees C without significantly more cooling because at that point the copper PCB wasn't actually getting that hot uh, but it sounds like you need active cooling or uh, there's just too much solder paste that's maybe causing a little bit of thermal resistance between the LED and PCB. But certainly this PCB will allow me to continue work with the driver PCB and when you're driving the LEDs at a reasonable current this copper PCB certainly gets hot enough without a heat sink for me to test that the thermal throttling is working properly. It'll be interesting to see how all of that works. 
But that is a copper core PCB from JLC PCB with some Lumileds Rubix LEDs, which I thought were quite interesting. So if you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. Hope you enjoyed the video, and until next time, thanks for watching.